When I went into psychiatry in 1950, <coughs> fortunately not knowing anything, but one of the thing, one of the conditions was, as part of my offer for the job, I would have to learn psychiatry, which is fair enough. 1950, we had no treatment for any of the major psychoses. The only treatment was to lock them up forever. We had no treatment. When, in 1950, we used to lock them up forever. In 2007, we lock them up with their drugs forever. There's no difference. They said they may be worse off today because they're also being destroyed. Their body chemistry is being destroyed by the modern drugs, which didn't happen nearly so much with the old drugs. Abram Hoffer was born a few miles south of Weber in Saskatchewan. His parents were Austrians of Jewish descent who had come to Canada with an agricultural vision. By the time young Abram came along, the Hoffer family farm was doing very well. Abram, however, preferred schoolwork to farm work. In school, Abram studied the Pellagra epidemic. Pellagra killed 100,000 Americans before its cause was discovered. It was caused by a deficiency of niacin, also known as vitamin B3. The U.S. government mandated the enrichment of flour with iron and B vitamins, which ended the Pellagra epidemic in 1938. That was the same year Abram Hoffer got his Bachelor of Science degree and turned 21. He earned his PhD in agricultural chemistry in 1944. He became a medical doctor in 1949. Abram Hoffer was made head of the psychiatric research branch for the province of Saskatchewan in 1950. Psychiatry, by the way, is what you might call a, it's a it was a dumping ground. Whenever a doctor ran across a patient who was either schizophrenic or depressed or bipolar, or senile, they would then send him on to psychiatry, who would then put him into a mental hospital or to an institution. One of the main problems in mental hospital was that many of these patients were angry and excited and hostile. The poor people were terror-stricken, they were screaming, they were shouting. There was bedlam. Bedlam was a good term for any old mental hospital. There was really bedlam there. And the main thing was to give people barbiturates or sedatives to try and relax them a bit. Antipsychotic or neuroleptic drugs were discovered in the 1950s. Chlorpromazine was the best known of these. These drugs spread like wildfire through the psychiatric community. And these drugs settled them down very, very quickly. It's amazing. You get a screaming, shouting, crying patient, and three days later, he's, he's blah. Now, he wasn't any better, but he appeared to be better. He was socially a lot better. They couldn't think, they couldn't reason, they had no motivation, they were slobbering, sitting in front of their TV, they couldn't work. They were hopelessly ill people, and the only advantage was that they weren't running around on the streets crying. They were being locked up or kept at home, and no one knew about it. That was the situation of psychiatry. So we, we were put in charge of all the failures in medicine. The large mental hospital at Weyburn was one of the two main mental hospitals in the province and one of Hoffer's chief responsibilities. When it was built in 1920, it was the largest building in the Commonwealth. Over half the patients at Weyburn were schizophrenic. Dr. McCarricker, who was in charge of the whole unit, he was in charge of the psychiatric services branch. He was a very kind man. He also had the idea that the Quakers had in 1850. And this was that first of all, you had to provide shelter. Secondly, you had to provide good food. Thirdly, you had to be kind and sympathetic. The Quakers in 1850 didn't believe in doctors or nurses. They would take insane people, up to 12, move them into a house without nurses or doctors. Their own people would run them. They would hold them there, didn't they? Be gentle to them, kind, they'd work with them. 
Every Saturday night they'd have a party and a dance and the staff would dance with the patients. It, it was really a very humane situation. Schizophrenia is characterized by abnormalities in the perception of reality. Distortions in perception may affect all the senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch. But it most commonly manifests as hallucinations and delusions, or disorganized speech and thinking. If you had the right genes, if you had the right genetic structure, and now there's evidence for that, <laughs> that w which would allow <clears throat> the conversion of too much adrenaline to adrenochrome, which was a hallucinogen in the brain, that if this happened, that this would act on the brain as if they had taken LSD, and they would then become psychotic. With adrenochrome, your legs seem a very long way down. Your clothes may become uncomfortable. And particularly if you're convinced that something is wrong, almost intolerable. Small distortions can be even more frightening than large ones, because you can't be sure that they are distortions. And as tension mounts, so does one's uncertainty. Ours is a simple, comprehensive hypothesis that wasn't based upon chance. We actually derived our hypotheses from very careful observations that had been made by Humphrey Osmond and John Smithies and myself. That was our hypothesis. Ours is the only rational hypothesis there is. The average psychiatrist will not answer your question. Ask him what causes schizophrenia. I don't know. They think it's biochemical. They use the word biochemical, but they don't understand what that means. Because when you load someone up with a toxic drug, you're not giving him a biochemical treatment. You're merely poisoning him. And it's easy enough to poison people, and that's no problem. So there are no theories that are acceptable except ours. We now, by that time, knew that niacin might protect the cell against the effect of adrenochrome. So I decided that we would try niacin. It became mandatory for all my patients that they would all go on to niacin. I use drugs too. The vitamin didn't work fast enough and the drugs did, so the best solution was to combine them. So I'd start my patients on the drugs, which would help settle them down very quickly, help take away their anxiety, their hostility, their depression, start them on vitamins. And we use the drugs as you would use a crutch for a person with a broken leg. As soon as the leg is mended, you throw away the crutch. As soon as our patients are mended, we throw away the drugs. And I think that's how they ought to be used. So that's why we get the recoveries that we see by the combination. And this is what's called orthomolecular. Two-time Nobel Prize winning chemist Linus Pauling also championed the use of vitamins as treatment. Pauling coined the term orthomolecular medicine in 1968. The Greek ortho means correct. So orthomolecular means the right molecules in the right amounts. The medical profession has been very hostile toward orthomolecular medicine, especially the psychiatric profession. It wasn't even aware of it, of course, until 1968 when Linus Pauling published his very famous paper in science called Orthomolecular Psychiatry. Pauling never accepted anyone's word. He did his own thinking. You know, Pauling was the world's most famous scientist. He had a double Nobel Prize one for his work with chemistry. In fact, his work in chemistry is the absolute basis of all modern medicine. He, he, he showed how molecules react with each other. Most people don't understand schizophrenia. If a, if a patient tells the psychiatrist that he, he or she is hearing voices, what does that mean? If the doctor, unless the doctor has heard voices himself, it has no meaning. He can't visualize this happening. So we thought, first of all, if we're going to deal with schizophrenia, we have to understand its psychology. And we also said we will take hallucinogenic drugs <clears throat> like LSD and mescaline, and later on adrenochrome and adrenalutein, we will take these drugs and see what it does to us. Then we'll have a much better comprehension of what is happening to our patients. We had to take this stuff ourselves to test its effect. We found that when it goes into the brain, it makes the brain less able to use its energy. After inhaling adrenalutin, Dr. Hoffer became suspicious of everyone. It took half an hour to choose between tea or coffee, 
turned morose and thought he'd better give up his job. In 1957, we first reported our findings, 1957. Until then, I was considered one of the top North American researchers. And that was because we never did anything important. <laughs> we published a lot of papers, a lot of papers, but they're of no value. But as soon as we began to publish it, we were getting results with nice, and you should have seen the world collapse about us. They said, oh my God, these guys are heretics. A family from Carmel, their 12-year-old son was schizophrenic. And his father, a doctor, called me and was crying. And I said, what's wrong? He said, my son, I've just been told by his psychiatrist that he will never get well, never get well. And so what? when he was given that horrible news, he began to spend as much time as he could in the library. And he ran across the first paper we ever published in 1957, where we first described the use of vitamins for the treatment of schizophrenia. I said, get hold of some niacin and talk to his doctor. Maybe he will agree to put him on it. And he said to, to the son's doctor, would you please try this niacin? And told him what he knew about it. The doctor was very annoyed, very hostile. And he immediately issued two lies. He said, first of all, it'll fry his brain. And then he said, a second lie, we have tried it, it doesn't work. If they had tried it and it didn't work, why didn't they publish it? And there was never a single publication from them saying it didn't work. They never tried it. The idea of the Saskatchewan plan was to build hospitals that would be really good hospitals, where people would be held until they got well. They would keep patients even three to six, 12 months if necessary. Then the drugs came along. They were so dramatic that psychiatry began to think, we don't need these hospitals. Their plan was not to really build a large number of smaller institutions where they could house them properly. Their plan was simply to put them all on drugs and discharge them. And for a while, it was an enormous feather in your cap if the superintendent of a hospital could claim that he was emptying his hospital faster than you were. If you started off the hospital with 2,000 patients and five years later you only had 1,000, that was kind of great news. Where did the 1,000 go? They went onto the streets. They went into terrible nursing homes. They, they, went, onto, they went into terribly undesirable places. And now we are in the area of big pharma. We have huge companies that uh, spend billions of dollars in research and investigation. The investigation is not really that hot because they don't do much original stuff. They, they allow much of the original stuff is done for them by university professors who don't get paid for it. So we are giving them free research personnel. But as soon as something seems to be valuable, they take out a patent on it and they make the money out of it. There's no profit today and this sounds very cynical. There's no profit today in getting people well. Our society is based upon the fact that we have to have a certain proportion of people sick so that we can treat them. Hope. You can't live without hope. Suicide. High suicide rate with schizophrenics. High suicide rate with depressions. Very high, very high. It's always due to the fact that they have been not given any hope, their hope has been taken away, because that's one of the most important therapeutic principles we have, hope. Science is a way of investigating phenomena. It doesn't really give us any final answers. It does give us many answers. It doesn't give us the final answer. We don't know anything, do we? Let's all think about it. How is it possible for the Earth to go around the sun? We're millions of miles away. What, what's that fantastic attraction that keeps us from flying off into space? Well, we have laws. We have the laws of gravity. We have the laws of movement. Newton made those very clear. 
We have all these laws. We know that these things happen, but we don't understand why they happen. I think there is some kind of unity in the whole universe. How it came about, I don't have the slightest idea, but there is something. There is something called life force. There's a fantastic tenacity to living, which is hard to understand. And now we have a new paradigm, which is called vitamin S treatment. We initiated this whole mega vitamin concept. Our work actually is the first in the world to create public attention to the fact that vitamins were therapeutic in themselves, that you could use them for a large number of conditions that were not considered vitamin deficiency diseases, and that you'd have to use them in the right concentration. There was no, no God didn't say, you must only use time in tiny milligrams. God said, if you have time, use it as you need it. If you're in vitamin C, use it as you need it. And that was the major thing. So I think that, and I think that's going to revolutionize medicine, starting to do that now. It led to the orthomolecular treatment. It arose from the adrenochrome hypotheses. And as a result of this hypothesis, as a result of this paradigm change, we now have a treatment for schizophrenia, which is not perfect, but awful better, certainly a lot better than just using drugs. So I think, I would hope that my major contribution one day will be that I was one of the pioneers in cre helping create the new vitamin S treatment paradigm. So I don't have the answer, but one day we're going to have the answers, and when we have, when orthomolecular medicine has been take, has taken over all of medicine, instead of spending billions of dollars examining one drug after another that's toxic, we will now start to look exactly at each particular disease and find out what are the needs for that particular disease. That's what's going to happen. <laughs>